come up to the stage, debaters, two young men in the prime of their lives, Richard Wolf, who will be who will be uh, defending the proposition socialism is preferable to capitalism as an economic system that promotes freedom, equality, and prosperity. Gene Epstein will uh, be taking the negative on that. Each candidate, the way this will work is that each uh, debater will have 17 and a half minutes in that last 30 seconds. When it comes, we'll understand why it's there. But each of them will have 70, uh, 70 minutes and 30 seconds to lay out an initial case. We'll do five minutes each of rebuttal. I'm going to beat them up a little bit uh, with a moderator's prerogative and some questions. And we're going to open it up to 30 minutes or more of audience Q&A, uh, five minutes each of closing statement, seven and a half. And, and again, there's 30 seconds. You know, this is where the world changes in, that, in those 30 seconds. Uh, and then we will uh, take another vote, and we'll see who's, uh, who is the big winner. Um, Jane, could you please, and if you haven't voted yet, you've got about five seconds to go, uh, please make a vote. Uh, either vote for the proposition against it or undecided. You need to vote now in order to vote later. Um, and without further ado, let's have Richard Wolf come up and explain to us why socialism is preferable to capitalism as an economic system that promotes freedom, equality, and prosperity. Richard Wolf, you have to save. Thank you all for coming. I assume that socialism is the reason that you came, either for it or against it. And I hope that the things I have to say will make some sense uh, of it for you. I did want to comment on the notion that Reason Magazine is free and that the Understanding Marxism book costs money. And I want to urge you not to infer from the price what the values of these things are. That would be a mistake. It would be confusing the price with the value. And for those of you that know something about socialist theory, that's something you want to avoid. OK. Socialism preferable to capitalism. My basic argument is that's a very low bar. That's not asking much. And I want to make that case as strongly as I know how. But I have a problem in the very beginning, as I always do, traveling around this country talking about this. And that is, we are like bears in this country, coming out of a hibernation, about 70 years of it, since 1945, when everything changed. I'm in a society in which socialists, communists, Marxists, occupied all the normal positions in society as teachers and workers and bureaucrats and unionists. When we had a New Deal that celebrated many of the objectives socialists have always supported, this across the United States had a big picture over the war, the clerk's office where you bought, bought stamps. And there was Uncle Sam with his hat, arm in arm, with Uncle Joe, which stood for Joseph Stalin. After that, there was, not so surprisingly, a terrible reaction. The business community and the right wing in America was horrified that for the 1930s, we had had a program of raising taxes on corporations and the rich in order to fund the creation for the first time in American history of social security, unemployment compensation, the first minimum wage, and a public employment project that hired 15 million people. The rich had to pay, and the mass of the Americans got the benefits. This was so horrific, it freaked out the forerunners of the Koch brothers. And then an alliance with the Soviet Union finished off whoever wasn't freaked out already. And so in 1945, everything had to be undone. The New Deal coalition, for those of you who remember your history, socialists, communists, 
the CIO unions representing tens of millions of American workers, they're the ones that made all that happen. They're the ones that made Roosevelt do all those things. And they had to be defeated, and they were. And the way you break up a coalition is you find the weakest link, or what you can make out to be the weakest link, and suddenly communists and socialists who had been the militants making the 1930s the greatest unionization period in American history. We never had anything like it before. We've never had anything like it since. Communists had to be transformed, and likewise socialists. From the great allies in the war, from the great vanguard of social programs in the 30s, they became agents of a foreign power likely to be interested in strangling your cat. And they had to be driven out of the unions, 1947 Taft-Hartley, driven out of their teaching jobs, driven out of the consciousness of the American people who were terrorized about being interested in those things, as they have mostly been in the last 40, 50, 60, 70 years. A personal note, when I went to college as a young person, I was interested in learning about Marxism, and I asked my teachers in the university, what course can I take to learn about Marxism? Half my teachers explained to me there isn't any, nobody here knows anything about it. The other half said, oh, we know about it, but we're way too scared. We're not going to teach you anything about it. In my undergraduate and my graduate years, and I majored in economics, I'm an economics professor, here's a fact. No one ever in any economics course assigned me one word of Karl Marx. Is that because he had nothing to teach us? Don't be silly. They were just afraid. 75 years of fear. There was nothing smart and nothing excusable in any of that. Oh, and let me mention, since it might be of some interest to you, the three schools I attended were Harvard, Stanford, and Yale. And if they don't have the courage, what can you expect from Eastern Kentucky. So I have a problem to talk to you about socialism because unless you're a very unusual American, and there are some, or a foreigner because the situation's different abroad, you don't know much about socialism or what you do know is 75 years out of date because it's changed a lot as I'm going to point out to you as I go through the argument. Okay, let's do it. Socialists disagree, they always have, from the beginning. Socialism is a product of capitalism, it always was. There was no socialism before capitalism came into being. Why? Because capitalism in the French and American revolutions made a big fat promise when it asked people to leave the feudalism that existed before and shift over to capitalism. It made the promise, as in the French Revolution, that capitalism would bring with it liberty, equality, fraternity, and let's add democracy and prosperity. Socialism is the movement that recognizes that what capitalism promised, liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy, wasn't delivered and never was and the socialism is a movement which, if it has anything in common among its different tendencies, is a notion that we can do better than capitalism. It's a yearning to do better. It's the kind of yearning slaves had to go beyond slavery, or serfs to go beyond feudalism. Employees and the people who empathize with them figure we can go better and do better than capitalism. That's what socialism is. Beyond that, socialists agree about three fall, flaws, failures of capitalism. And again, briefly, to go through them, but there are three. Capitalism is unstable. Capitalism is unequal. And capitalism is fundamentally undemocratic. Let me briefly explain. Unstable. 
every 47 years in every capitalist country, on average, there's an economic downturn, not due to nature and not due to war, just built into the system. It's called the business cycle because it always comes back. Millions of people lose work, businesses go out of business, a crazy crash. You know what it's like if you pick up the financial press, you know we're waiting for the next one to hit this year or next. Mr. Trump's biggest worry about being reelected is that it'll happen too soon. He worries, as we all do. It's an unstable system. That's crazy to live in an unstable system. If you live with a roommate as unstable as capitalism, you would have moved out long ago. What an amazing thing to accept a system that every four to seven years threatens millions of people with unemployment, lost income, interrupted vacation, interrupted education, lost mortgage, you name it. Then let's do the next one, inequality. Oxfam in England keeps track of these things. And the latest number from them summarizes it all. The 80 or 90 richest people in the United States together, excuse me, in the world, have more wealth than the bottom half of the population, three and a half billion people. That's the achievement of capitalism, that kind of distribution. If you took away half the wealth of those 80 to 100 people, guess what? They'd still be the richest people in the world, only you now have a vast amount of money to deal with the sickness, the lack of education, the absence of water, the insufficiency of food of the vast majority of people. What an achievement, such inequality. And now finally, the lack of democracy. The part of it you probably know and thought about is the buying of our political process on display every day, everywhere. You all see it, you all know it. But here's a part of the lack of democracy you might not have thought about. Long ago, we got rid of kings, queens. We decided we didn't need somebody sitting at the top of society telling us all what to do so that we would all be, oh, let's call it subjects. That's what they called us. So we got rid of the kings and queens and we said, no, you know, we can, we can run this in a different way, this political system. We can all get together, we can periodically vote and take steps and collectively make the decisions that used to be in the hands of the kings and the queens. How interesting. We democratized, at least a little, the politics. Well, what we didn't do was to democratize the economics. So what do we have inside each enterprise? A little king, mm -hmm. an owner, it's true. a manager, a board of directors, a king in the court, who run everything, who make all the key decisions, what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits everybody in the enterprise helps to produce. If it's too difficult for you to hear me out, then it's a I never heard this guy before. Guys. I like him. We're good. Please keep going. Please, please hear out Professor Wolf. Please respect Professor Wolf. We don't have democracy in our workplaces. We never did. The commitment to democracy is verbal in this society, limited to the voting activity where we live, but not where we work. And as adults, that's where we spend most of our time, going to work, being at work, and recuperating from work. In the workplace, no democracy at all. We do what we're It's true. Doing. I really like this guy. What we produce belongs to someone Never else. thought I would like the words no of a Marxist. What they do with it, how this is organized, what the technology is. And socialists, therefore, have said, my God, we can do better than capitalism. And that's what they want. And that's what they agree on. But here's where the disagreements. How do you go about it? What do you do? And we have a benefit. 
socialists do today. We have some experiments that were made in the 20th century. Russia, China, Cuba, and so on. And we learned from those experiments what works and what doesn't, what should be pursued and what should be set aside. And so the new socialism, and if you're not aware of it, I think I'm in love. Go back to what I said at the beginning. This guy's fucking great. Keeping up, which is hard to do in a society which makes socialism a taboo. What has happened to socialism is a refocusing of itself. It's not interested so much in the state doing things that achieved rapid rates of economic growth. True enough. But it also left too much power in the hands of too few people, and that has to be addressed and dealt with, which socialists have been doing. And the new focus, the new focus of socialism is to do something at the workplace that was never done, to go beyond capitalism in the organization of the workplace, to democratize the workplace, to make where we spend most of our adult lives at work a place where democracy reigns, where all the people who work in an enterprise participate in making the decisions of what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits. Because if they all together made those decisions, we wouldn't give some people $150 billion and other people have to borrow money to get their kid through college. We wouldn't have the inequality. We certainly wouldn't allow the irrationality of every four to seven year instability. Everybody together would choose a technology that isn't dangerous to the health of all of us at the workplace. We could go beyond capitalism, but we have to have the courage to do what was not yet done, not in Roosevelt's New Deal and not in Russia or China either. 